Hello and welcome back to Introductory Astronomy. Today we're covering Chapter 1, Part 2. I would like to start by the motion of the Moon. Just as the planets revolve counterclockwise around the Sun, as seen from the direction of the celestial North Pole, the Moon revolves counterclockwise around the Earth. Because the Moon's orbit is tipped a little over 5 degrees from the plane of the Earth's orbit, the Moon's path takes it slightly north and then slightly south, but it is always somewhere near the ecliptic. The changing shape of the Moon as it revolves around the Earth is one of the most easily observed phenomena in astronomy. The Moon always keeps the same side facing the Earth. The man in the moon is produced by the familiar features on the moon's near side, but you never see the far side of the moon. The changing shape of the moon, as it passes through its cycle of phases, is produced by sunlight illuminating different parts of the side of the moon that we can see. Let's take a look at lunar phases. Because the Moon orbits the Earth, the visible fraction of the lunar sunlit phase varies from night to night, although keep in mind the Moon always keeps the same phase toward our planet. Note the location of the small straight arrows which mark the same point on the lunar first surface at each phase shown. The complete cycle of lunar phases that is shown in this picture, starting at the waxing crescent phase and following the Moon's orbit counterclockwise, takes about 29 and a half days to complete. Rising and setting times for some of these phases are indicated in the picture. Now the fact that the Moon takes about 29 and a half days to go through a whole cycle of phases, we call that the synodic month. On the other hand, the time to make a full 360 degree rotation around the Earth, that is the sidereal month, and it is about two days shorter. Remember, phases are due to different amounts of sunlit portion being visible from Earth. The Moon does not produce its own light, but it reflects light from the Sun. In this sequence of lunar phases, the Moon cycles through its phases from crescent to full to crescent. You see the same face of the Moon, the same mountains, craters, plains, but the changing direction of sunlight is what produces the lunar phases. So starting from New Moon, we have waxing crescent, first quarter, waxing gibbous, full Moon, waning gibbous, third quarter, waning crescent, and then the whole cycle starts over again. If you notice on the bottom of the slide, I put a link to a Wikipedia video file. That shows you the lunar oscillation or libration of the Moon with phase. It is just a one minute video. In terms of remembering all the nomenclature for the cycles of the Moon, I put a YouTube link right there, which is a rap song that sings all through the phases of the Moon. So I think that's very useful. Once you listen to it once, it gets stuck in your head and you won't forget any of this waning, waxing, gibbous or crescent um, vocabulary. Now, the Moon is tidally locked in orbit with the Earth. And that happens because the Earth exerts tidal forces on the Moon's rocky interior. As a result, the Moon ends up rotating 
with the same period around its own axis as it is orbiting around the Earth. That is what tidally locked means. And as a result for us, we always end up seeing the same side of the moon. I did put another link to a YouTube website on the bottom that shows a very nice animation on how this takes place. I'd like to talk a little bit about shadows. If you take a look at this picture right here, we have a light source, we have a little tack on the end of the pencil, and two screens. If a light source is extended, like this light bulb right here, then any object has a shadow that consists of two zones. One zone, the partial zone that you can see over here, is called the penumbra. And the other zone that has a full shadow, right here, that is called the umbra. The reason I want to talk about shadows is because I'd like to talk about eclipses. Eclipses occur when Earth, Moon, and Sun form a straight line. If you take a look at the bottom half, we have the unfavorable scenario for eclipses. And on the bottom half of this picture, we have the favorable scenario for an eclipse. So an eclipse occurs when Earth, Moon, and Sun are precisely aligned. If the Moon's orbital plane lay in exactly the plane of the ecliptic, this alignment would occur once a month. However, because the Moon's orbit is inclined at about 5 degrees to the ecliptic, not all the configurations are favorable for producing an eclipse. But again, an eclipse will take place during the bottom half scenario. So when do we actually have a lunar eclipse? The Earth has to be between the Moon and the Sun. We get what we call a partial eclipse when only part of the Moon is in shadow, and we get a total eclipse when the whole Moon is in shadow. So a lunar eclipse occurs when the Moon passes through the Earth's shadow. At these times, we see a darkened copper-colored moon, as shown by the partial eclipse in the inset photograph on the bottom right. The red coloration is caused by sunlight deflected by Earth's atmosphere onto the moon's surface. An observer on the moon would see Earth surrounded by bright, but narrow ring of orange sunlight. Of course, this figure is not drawn to scale and only the Earth's umbra is shown, but you get the idea. Here's a more complete picture, again, not to scale. Remember, the Earth's shadow consists of the partial shadow zone that is called the penumbra and the full shadow zone that is called the umbra. If the Moon passes through the Earth's full shadow, the umbra, then we see a lunar eclipse. And if the entire surface of the Moon enters this umbra, then the lunar eclipse is total. Here's a table of the total and partial eclipses of the Moon in the years 2010 to 2017. On the first column, it gives you the time when this will occur, the date, excuse me, that this will occur. The second column gives you the time, and time is given in green, which means time, which is what GMT stands for. On the third column, it gives the length of totality, so for how long does it last? And on the fourth column, it gives the length of the eclipse, and that does not include the penumbral face.
There are typically one or two lunar eclipses per year. How about solar eclipses? Solar eclipses take place when the moon is between the Earth and the sun. If you take a look at frame A, the moon's shadow, which of course consists of two parts, the umbra, where no sunlight is seen, and the penumbra, where a portion of the sun is visible, gives us the total scenario. And the sun will be completely obscured in this case if you're in the location of the umbra and you have a total solar eclipse. On frame B, if we are in the umbra, then we see the total eclipse and there's a very nice picture, photograph right here, of a total solar eclipse and partial eclipse in the penumbra area. In frame C, if the moon is too far from the Earth at the moment of the eclipse, then the umbra does not reach the Earth. You see how it doesn't actually fall on the surface of the planet. Therefore, there is no region of totality. Instead, we have what is called an annular eclipse. That we have this ring phenomena, this annulus phenomena. So we have a partial solar eclipse when only part of the sun is blocked, a total when it is all blocked, and annular when the moon is too far from the Earth for the total solar eclipse. Now, if you remember, the sun appears approximately in the sky at the same angular diameter, which is half a degree, as the moon that we talked about before. Now, this is due to some fantastic good luck. We live on a planet with a moon that is almost exactly the same angular diameter as the sun. Now, thanks to that coincidence, when the moon passes in front of the sun, it is almost exactly the right size to cover the sun's brilliant surface, but leave the sun's atmosphere visible. So the angular diameter of both the moon and the sun is exactly the same, even though there are different sizes but because of their different location, it works out just right. This sequence of photos right here shows the first half of a total solar eclipse. On the bottom left, we have the moon moving from the right and it's just beginning to cross in front of the sun, so you can see that a little bit right there then the disk of the moon is gradually covering the disk of the sun. We get to the point where we have totality and you can see a little bit of the pink prominences sticking out. And this is a longer exposure photograph that shows the fainter corona. Right here is another picture of the chromosphere and corona with the prominences sticking out. Now, both the Earth and Moon's orbits are slightly elliptical. This drawing right here is a little bit exaggerated, but it helps illustrate the point. Now, perihelion is the position closest to the Sun. So when the Earth is closest to the Sun, we say it is at the perihelion. The position furthest away from the Sun is called the aphelion. Now, in terms of the moon's motion, perigee is a position closest to the Earth, and apogee is a position furthest away from the Earth. Now, to help you remember these terms, ye is the Greek word for Earth. So, perigee, perige, is for something being close to the Earth, and apogee, apogee, is something being further away. 
Ilios is a Greek word for sun, so perihelion is for an object that's close to the sun, and aphelion is for an object being furthest away from the sun. Now, I mentioned this because because the angular diameter of the moon and the sun vary slightly, just as shown in the picture right there. The disk of the moon is sometimes too small to cover the disk of the sun. This means the umbra of the moon does not reach the earth and the eclipse is annular. From the earth, you see an annular eclipse because the moon's angular diameter is smaller than the angular diameter of the sun. In the photograph of the annular eclipse of 1994, the dark disk of the moon is almost exactly centered on the bright disk of the sun. And when the earth is near the perihelion, and the moon is near its apogee, we see an annular solar eclipse. Here's another beautiful picture of an almost total annular eclipse that was taken in May 30th, 1984. And here is what we call the diamond ring effect. So as the name implies, we have um, the little part that is sticking out, almost like having a, a diamond ring. Now, observing solar eclipses, never ever look directly into the sun, especially not with binoculars or a telescope. Unless, of course, the telescope has a special filter or it is a solar telescope. Here is illustrated a safe way to observe a solar eclipse by using a projection technique as shown right here. Or, of course, you can use the eclipse sunglasses. We had um, an annular solar eclipse on May 20th. So that was a few days ago. Now, eclipses don't occur every month because the Earth and Moon's orbits are not in the same plane. For an eclipse to occur, the line of intersection of the two planes must lie along the Earth-Sun line. Thus, eclipses can occur just at specific times of the year. And in this illustration right here, only the umbra of each shadow is shown for clarity. Here's a table of solar eclipses for the years 2010 to 2019. There are on average about one to two sol total solar eclipses per year. But as you notice in the last column, you have to be within the right area of visibility to observe uh, them. The next one that's coming up is going to be November 13, 2012. As you notice right here, it's going to be a total solar eclipse. And if you go to the last column, in order to observe that, you have to travel to Australia or the South Pacific. And this brings me to the last part of the chapter, the idea of measuring distance. So we talked a little bit about the angular diameter of celestial objects projected on the celestial sphere but we really do need to know how far away they are. Surveyors often use a simple geometry and trigonometry to estimate the distance to a faraway object by a method called triangulation. By measuring the angles at A and B and the length of a baseline, the distance can be calculated without the need for direct measurement. So in this scenario right here, you don't have to get wet crossing the river to measure the distance to the tree, 
but instead you can measure these two angles right here, angle A and angle B, and measure the baseline, and you use simple trigonometry and you're able to find the distance to the tree in this case. Now this is very useful, so astronomers use that a lot. What astronomers use is called parallax, which is very similar to triangulation. Parallax looks at apparent motion of an object against a distant background from two different vantage points. Before I explain what this picture means, I would like you all to stretch out your hand straight in front of you and pull out your index finger and have your index finger cover an object in the room or wherever you're located at and close one eye. Then open that eye and close the other eye and notice what happens to your finger in relation to the background object that you chose. What you're basically seeing is the apparent motion of your index finger, but you know full well that you have not moved your finger. So that's the idea of parallax. Astronomers use that same idea, only the baseline for us in this example was the distance between our left and right eye. The baseline that astronomers use is the whole diameter of the Earth. Now take a look at the picture. So if we have a telescope at position A on one end of the Earth and we'll look at an object in space, you see where it is projected in position A prime in relation to the background stars. If we take the same picture of that object but on location B on the other side of the Earth, then we have a picture of position B prime of this object in relation to the background stars. Therefore the object as seen from A looks to be over here and as seen from B looks like it has shifted over there from here to over here. So we use this exact same idea we have the baseline we know the distance from one side of the Earth to the other. We know the angle at A or at B or the 90 degree right here and we can calculate what's called the parallax. Once we have that we should be able to figure out how far away the object is located. Measuring the Earth's radius, this is very, very important and it was first done by Eratosthenes, a Greek philosopher, about 2300 years ago. Now he realized that the sun's rays when striking different parts on the Earth's surface they were doing that at different angles and he figured that out by comparing the location of the city of Alexandria and the city of Syene. He was the one that realized that these different angles were due to the Earth's curvature and he was able to use triangulation to determine the Earth's radius and this was at the time when most people believe that the Earth was flat. So this is a pretty amazing achievement. He was able to measure that angle and the distance between the cities to get the radius of the Earth. I put a very good video link on YouTube. This video is narrated by Carl Sagan. It's about eight or ten minutes long and it explains step by step how Eratosthenes achieved this amazing accomplishment. So I would definitely recommend you spend the few minutes to watch that. Now let's combine these ideas. Imagine a ruler one AU long. 
Now AU, remember, stands for astronomical unit, which is by definition the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Now let this imaginary ruler be moved away from the Earth until it subtends an angular span of one arc second. The ruler will then be exactly one parsec from the Earth. And the symbol for parsec is lowercase pc. One parsec is another unit of distance in astronomy. And as you can see right there, one parsec is equivalent to 3.26 light years. Let me show you a drawing of what I just talked about. We're basically building a bigger baseline for objects that are further away from us. So instead of taking the two sides of the Earth, we need a bigger baseline. So what do we do? We take the locations of the Earth around the, the orbit on the Sun every six months to create this scenario right here with this baseline over here, which, is, which enables us to look even further away. Now, by definition, if the baseline of the right triangle is 1 AU and the object in the sky that we're looking at is subtending a 1 arc second angle, then it is 1 parsec away from us, or 206,265 AU, or 3.26 light years. And we can mathematically relate this so this distance right here to the object is equal to 1 divided by the parallax. As long as we use the units of parsecs for the distance and arc seconds for the parallax angle. So that is very, very useful for figuring out how far away objects are. This concludes uh, chapter one. I would like to go over a very quick summary. Astronomy is the study of the universe. Remember, astronomy is a science. It's not astrology. And because astronomy is a science, we use the scientific method of observation, theory, prediction, and so on and so forth. We can picture the stars as being on the inside of a celestial sphere, and it helps us locate things in the sky. Keep in mind that the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun is called the ecliptic, and it's at 23 and a half degrees to the celestial equator. This 23 and a half degree angle of the Earth's axis is what causes the seasons. Moon shines due to the reflected light from the sun, and it has phases. We also talked about lunar and solar eclipses. We talked about the solar versus the sidereal day, and that's due to the Earth's revolution around the sun. We talked about the synodic month versus the sidereal month, which is also due to the Earth's revolution around the sun. The tropical year versus the sidereal year, that is due to the precession of the Earth's axis. And we said a full precession is 26,000 years. Eclipses of sun and moon occur due to alignment. And they only occur occasionally since the orbits are not in the exact same plane. Distances can be measured through triangulation and parallax. This is very, very important to understand for the rest of the material. Study chapter 1.5 through 1.6. Log into Mastering Astronomy and start working on your homework and your quizzes. And this concludes chapter 1.